I am Dennis Tuberg, and you are listening to the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates radio program. Glad you decided to tune in today. Hey, the coronavirus situation has forced many into an early retirement. 40 million jobs have been lost in the last 10 weeks of the coronavirus pandemic. That's significant. Now, the good news is the country is in the early stages of reopening, but at this point, it's unclear as to how many of those jobs will return. This has many Americans facing a sudden and uncomfortable reality. The fact is they may be forced into an early retirement. Now, even if your employment hasn't been impacted by the pandemic, there's still a good chance you could end up in a similar situation. Allianz did a retirement risk readiness survey, and in that survey, they found that half of the American workforce will retire earlier than expected. And here's the key. The vast majority of those retiring earlier than expected will do so for reasons outside their control. And incidentally, that survey came out just before coronavirus started taking its toll on the economy. Now, contrary to what a number of people would tell you, the economy was not as strong as many would make it out to be going into the pandemic. In fact, Patrick Wyman said this, Crises, like pandemics, don't break things in and of themselves. They just show you what's already broken. Crises, like pandemics, don't break things in and of themselves. They show you what's already broken. Now, I wrote a book back in 2015 called New Retirement Rules, and in that book, I warned that the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, was inflating a bubble that would, at some point, have to burst. Coronavirus was simply the pin that burst the bubble. And now, the bubble is bursting, present tense. Now, here's the reality of bubbles. Bubbles rarely unwind all at once. This one Probably won't either, but it will unwind all the same. And if you're out there thinking about retiring, or you have been forced into an early retirement because of the economy, this is important to understand that bubbles rarely unwind all at once, and this one probably won't either, meaning that we're probably not done with this. And those who think that the economy will recover quickly. In other words, it'll be a V-shaped recovery, in my view, are thinking along the lines of fantasy. I mean, if you think about it, you cannot recover in months from a 30% unemployment rate. Well, the headline rate has not been released as I record this. I expect that we're going to see a 27 to 28% headline rate in unemployment. That's huge. Those are Depression-era unemployment numbers. And we've destroyed a lot of potential employment infrastructure. In fact, Peter Schiff, who's been a past guest here on this program, wrote about two weeks ago that a survey of small business owners found that about half of them are not planning on reopening or are assuming or making plans to permanently close. Small businesses employ almost 50% of the country's workers. If these businesses are closing in these numbers, it cannot be a V-shaped recovery. In fact, I think there is a many arguments that can be made A lot of evidence that is emerging that tells us that the volatility is just beginning and the environment in which you may be trying to retire or plan your finances is likely to get more challenging. I mean, when you simply take a look at the policy response, the Federal Reserve is now printing money in the trillions of dollars. 
conversations that took place a decade ago in terms of billions of dollars are now taking place in terms of trillions of dollars. The conversation is the same. The Federal Reserve says they're going to create money. They're going to print money. They're going to engage in quantitative easing. Call it whatever you will. It all means the same thing. And they're going to do this on a temporary basis. The Federal Reserve is now directly buying junk bonds. The Federal Reserve is now loaning money to the U.S. Treasury, who is purchasing corporate bonds via SPVs after the CARES Act. This is all, according to those in charge of policy response, temporary. Now, a study of history tells us that not only are we in uncharted territory here, but these policy responses are almost always never temporary. They're in place until they no longer work, and some catastrophic outcome occurs, and then they have to be changed. Now, in the book New Retirement Rules that I mentioned at the top of the segment here, I predicted that the bubble being inflated by the Federal Reserve would eventually burst. Now, to be fair, uh, I did not mention timing because timing is so, so difficult to predict. As I often state, the what is pretty easy to predict. The when is very difficult to predict. Now, the prediction that this bubble would eventually burst was easy to make since a study of similar policy responses historically proved 100% of the time that money printing eventually leads to the same outcome every single time. This time is no different, and now the extreme money printing that we saw after the financial crisis of a little more than 10 years ago now is super, super extreme. The government is taking massive action in response to this situation. And what's the goal? Well, at least in part, the goal is to reflate the bubble. The CARES Act, a $2 trillion stimulus package, has been passed. I'm sure that you've all noticed that the year is 2020, and 2020 is a big election year. Mark my words, we will see more stimulus packages And the cost will be trillions of dollars. And the only way to fund these programs is more money creation. About two weeks ago, as Bloomberg reported, the Federal Reserve is now gauging interest from municipalities and states around the country to see which of these entities might re- might require or might like to have loans from the Fed. Well, initially, the loan term might be three years, but there are all, already there are bipartisan groups of senators saying, hey, we can't do this for three years. We need to loan the states and the local government's money for longer than that. And as I mentioned... Probably the most alarming part of all this to me, if you're planning for retirement, is that as part of the recently passed CARES Act, the Federal Reserve has now ceded at least some of the control of the printing press to the Washington politicians. What could possibly go wrong? Now, it doesn't matter what political party you identify with, if any. We can all agree on this. Collectively speaking, politicians have never shown restraint with regard to spending. And now, all these politicians that have never shown restraint now have their collective fingers fingers rather on the money creation switch. It is nothing short of alarming, and it will make the ultimate economic and financial destination at which we arrive nothing short of ugly. This brings me to my point. We are in a new world, economically speaking and financially speaking. If you're planning for retirement and you decide to do things the way that you've always done them, or do them the way that many Wall Street-only advisors do things, you might find yourself down the road on the outside looking in. Now, that is obviously 
my opinion. Now, the sad truth is that many of these Wall Street-only advisors and many aspiring retirees don't use strategies when doing retirement planning. Strategies comprise a strategic plan to get you where you want to be at retirement while avoiding traps that could prevent you from reaching your goal. So strategies are a plan. And the plan is designed to get you where you want to be at retirement while avoiding the traps that could prevent you from reaching your goal. Now, buying and holding traditional investments in your IRA or 401k probably won't get you there. What happens to these types of investments when the market corrects? And by the way, John Williams, who will be my guest on next week's program, estimates that in the second calendar quarter of this year, gross domestic product, which is total economic output, will decline 50% from the second quarter of last year. 50%, 50%. Stocks cannot react favorably to that. And when you have traditional investments and the market corrects, you probably hear things like, stay in the market for the long haul. You can't time the market. You may hear, hey, keep your eyes on the horizon. These are all bits of advice that I would call sound bites, not strategies. A sound bite in this environment probably does not get you to where you need to be to have a comfortable, stress-free retirement. You need a strategy. And a strategy is exactly what my book, Revenue Sourcing, talks about. Now, Revenue Sourcing uh, was released uh, officially last week on Monday. And thank you to all of you who have supported the book. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, Revenue Sourcing uh, was number one, a number one bestseller in four Amazon categories this past week. Also a number one new release. So thank you all for supporting the book. And if you have not yet gotten a copy of the book, we have a promotional offer that we are carrying ahead. If you go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, there is a link there. And if you go buy the Kindle copy of the book, and follow the instructions on that web page and email us your receipt. We'll be very glad to send you a signed physical copy of the book. Revenue sourcing outlines a strategy. Revenue sourcing is not a soundbite. The book gives you a strategy to consider using in this post-pandemic recovery. So again, the website is retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. And while you're at the Retirement Lifestyle Advocates website, feel free to sign up for our weekly Portfolio Watch newsletter as well. If you're not yet a subscriber, there's no reason not to be. It's a free publication delivered every Monday at 5. We give you our take as to what's going on in the economy and the markets. Certainly uh, looking at things and getting as many perspectives as you can in today's challenging environment is extremely important. So that's the Portfolio Watch newsletter. You can find that and many other resources at retirementlifestyleadvocates.com. I'll be back after these words. You are listening to RLA Radio. I am your host, Dennis Tubergen. Glad you decided to tune in today. And hey, thanks to all of you that made Revenue Sourcing a number one bestseller this past week on Amazon. If you'd like to get a copy of Revenue Sourcing, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. There is a link there and there is a special promotional offer to get a Kindle copy of the book. And when you get the Kindle copy and send us your receipt for the Kindle copy, We will send you a physical copy of the book as well. Revenue sourcing is a strategy. And strategies, as I talked about in the last segment, not sound bites, are really what you need to be thinking about right now because the reality is this. If you're aspiring 
to be a retiree at some point in the next 10 years, it's my view that our economy and financial system have been forever altered by recent events. In fact, the CBO came out today and said, we're not going to see things get back to normal until 2030. Now, if you do have dreams of a comfortable, stress-free retirement, there are four lessons that you really need to keep in mind as you're doing your planning. And in this segment, I want to talk about those four lessons. Lesson number one. No one cares as much about your money as you do. Lesson number two, inspect what you expect in every area of your life, but especially when it comes to your money. Lesson number three, in every seed of adversity lies a seed of equal or greater opportunity. This lesson is laid out in the classic book authored by Napoleon Hill almost a century ago. The book is titled Think and Grow Rich, and this whole idea that in every seed of adversity lies a seed of equal or greater opportunity, I have found to be true over and over. And finally, lesson number four, if you do what everyone else does, you'll get get what everyone else gets. You can't follow the crowd when it comes to retirement planning unless you want to get the same outcome as the crowd gets. Now, that's not a good goal, Good goal, rather. The, most Americans will never realize their dream of a financially comfortable retirement. As I said at the outset of this segment, sound bites are things like staying in the market for the long haul, or you can't time the market, or keep your eyes on the horizon. Those are not strategies. Strategies give you a plan to get you where you want to be at retirement while avoiding the traps that could prevent you from reaching your goal. You know, Albert Einstein had a couple of quotes that are really relevant to this conversation. Mr. Einstein said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again while somehow expecting to get a different result. That's a really terrific definition of insanity. If you're using traditional investments in a new economy and you're buying stocks and you experienced a big stock decline in 2007, 2008, and you're in stocks again and you're hoping that stocks don't decline again, but you haven't changed your strategy, let me just tell you that hope is not a strategy. Mr. Einstein also said this, unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. In other words, critical thinking is required. Now that's true in a lot of different areas, but we're going to focus on investing and managing your nest egg today. You need to think critically, and you need to have strategies that make sense to you. Now, I mentioned Napoleon Hill's book, and one of the big lessons of the book is that in every seed of adversity lies a seed of equal or greater opportunity. Now, if you don't know the backstory, and if you haven't read the book, you should really read the book, but Mr. Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, is a classic from the 1930s. And the book studied success behaviors of some of the world's brightest and most successful people. Mr. Hill, in fact, was commissioned to write the book by none other than Mr. Andrew Carnegie himself. Now, when you're planning for retirement, this is true. In every seed of adversity lies a seed of equal or greater opportunity. Over the past several months, we have seen significant amounts of of adversity. Adversity, if you'll look, uncovers opportunity. And this is certainly true when it comes to planning retirement. If you're an aspiring retiree and you're investing traditionally, 
you might see a stock market bust as an extremely adverse event. Other would-be retirees see it for what it is. It's an opportunity provided the right strategy is in place. Here's where a soundbite won't help. Now, the revenue sourcing strategy described uh, in the book can help you create opportunities from adversity. That's one of the goals of the revenue sourcing strategy. And again, if you're just joining me, thank you for helping make the book a number one bestseller on Amazon this past week. And if you haven't yet got a copy, uh, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. And there's a link there for you to be able to get a copy of the book at a really good deal. And when you buy the Kindle version of the book, we'll send you a physical copy of the book as well. Just follow the instructions on the website. Again, the web address is retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. Now, the next big lesson is that you need to inspect what you expect. You can't just assume that everything is being taken care of. You have to have check systems in place to know that your dream of a comfortable retirement is on track and it's protected from threats. We sit down with our clients and monitor progress on a regular basis. So the question is this, are you inspecting what you expect in your personal financial situation and in your investments? Finally, the most important lesson of all, no one cares as much about your money as you do. No one cares as much about your money as you do. This is your money. You earned it. You saved it. You're counting on it. Let me give you a bit of advice. If you don't understand the strategy you're using to take care of your money, stop and take time to understand it. If you're not using a strategy, if you're using a soundbite, educate yourself. You need to adopt a strategy that will work for you. This is serious stuff, and your future depends on it. The reality is, no one does care as much about your money as you do. Now, in the revenue sourcing book, We give you not only the revenue sourcing strategy, but you also get information about how to maximize your benefits from Social Security, how to potentially reduce the taxes on your retirement account or your 401k. We affectionately refer to that as divorcing yourself from the IRS and your IRA or 401k. Uh, You'll find a lot of terrific information in the book. And if you would like to go back and listen to any of the podcasts or radio shows, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com and do that as well. You can also subscribe to the Portfolio Watch newsletter on the website. Portfolio Watch is a newsletter delivered every Monday at 5 o'clock. I give you my take as to what's going on in the economy and the markets. And again, that's every Monday at 5. It's delivered to you via email. I'll be back after these words. I am Dennis Tubergen. You are listening to RLA Radio. Glad you decided to listen in today. Hey, today I'm talking about some of the information you'll find in my new book, Revenue Sourcing. And if you've not yet picked up a copy of the book, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. And there is a link to allow you to buy the Kindle version of the book at a greatly reduced price. And when you email us your receipt, we'll be glad to send you a physical copy of the book. And thank you to all of you who've already supported the book, making it a number one Amazon bestseller. So one of the big questions in the book is, will we see inflation or will we see deflation? Because if we can figure out which of these economic outcomes is more likely, we know how to plan to manage our nest egg. Now, inflation is an expansion of the money supply. And when we have inflation, one of the symptoms is rising prices. Then there's deflation. Deflation is a contraction of the money supply. And one of the symptoms of deflation is falling prices. Well, presently, we have 
some of each. And at the end of this segment, I'm going to give you my forecast and give you some ideas as to how you might think about making some changes in your portfolio. But first, let me give you a little bit of a backstory because our money has changed a lot. And this is a fact that's really kind of hard to get your head around. See, money used to be an asset. And if you have money in the bank today, you think you have an asset. But see, today's money is debt. Money for most of history has been an asset, but today's money is debt. And let me give you just a bit of background on this before we get into what you should be doing. During World War I, many countries around the world abandoned the gold standard, and they did that because under the gold standard, you can only spend what you have in gold. So often throughout history, you've seen different circumstances, usually wars, that cost a lot of money. And as a result of these big expenditures, governments decide to print money, but then eventually they go back to the gold standard. Well, that's what happened after World War I. The United States returned to a gold exchange standard in 1919, which means that if you had a paper bill, you could exchange it for gold. Now, when the Depression hit, largely because the Federal Reserve reduced the backing of the U.S. dollar by gold, allowing them to print a lot more money, the dollar was backed 100% by gold, but then it was backed only 40% by gold. That created debt excesses, and the stock market crashed. So, The gold standard was completely eliminated in 1933, but in 1944, after World War II, the U.S. dollar was again exchangeable for gold. So gold is an asset. If you had dollars, you could exchange the dollars for assets. The difference was that the price of gold went to $35 an ounce in 1944, up from $20 an ounce just 11 years prior. Now, the dollar gained a lot of popularity. Everybody in the world used the dollar for international trade because it could be exchanged at any time for U.S. dollars. Then, as a result of massive government spending in the United States in the 60s for the Vietnam War, Medicare, Medicaid, the war on poverty, the politicians, again, started to print a lot of money. By 1971... President Richard Nixon had to go on television and say that he was going to temporarily suspend the redemptions of U.S. dollars for gold. At that point, our money changed from being an asset to being debt. Because at that point, all money would now be loaned into existence. And from 1971 all the way up to the financial crisis in 2008, the Federal Reserve would control the money supply by setting interest rates and reserve requirements. Now, if you go put money in your bank today, your banker has to reserve 10% of the deposit that you make, but can loan out the other 90%. This increases the money supply. So if you go put $100,000 into your bank, your banker would reserve 10%, and then could loan the remaining $90,000 to another bank customer. However, that bank customer does not walk out of the bank with $90,000 in cash. The bank gives that customer a cashier's check, and the $90,000 cashier's check gets deposited into that customer's bank. And to keep the conversation simple, we'll assume it's a different bank. So... The assets of the first bank are still $100,000. The assets of the second bank just increased by $90,000. Well, that bank has to reserve 10% or $9,000, but can loan out the other $81,000. And this process continues. My point is this. As long as borrowing continues, more money is created. The original $100,000 that the first customer deposits into the bank results in a million dollars of new money if maximum loans are taken. So in the past, if the Fed wanted to jumpstart the economy, the Federal Reserve Board would just reduce interest rates 
People would borrow, and since money is now loaned into existence, rather than being exchangeable for an asset, money is now debt, and more borrowing means more money is created. Here's the problem. When money is debt, and we start to have bankruptcies, like we're seeing now as a result of the coronavirus situation, Hertz has declared bankruptcy, J.C. Penney, the Sherman Group. Uh, there, there's just too many to, to count already this year. Now, debt goes unpaid. When debt goes unpaid, and because money is debt, money disappears from the financial system, the money supply contracts, and we have deflation. And one of the symptoms of deflation is prices dropping. Let me give you an example. Hertz, in 2019, decided they would go out and buy Corvette Z06s as a premium rental car. Now, these cars are amazingly hot Corvettes. $120,000 $120,000 to $130,000 new. Now you can buy one of Hertz's Z06 Vets with five to 6,000 miles on it for about $60,000, about half price. Before Hertz declared bankruptcy, you would not find one for that price. So we're seeing deflation. That's deflationary. Commercial real estate. We're seeing landlords now. Serve tenants with default notices. Those are leases that are going to go unpaid. That will be deflationary for commercial real estate. So my point is this. As money is loaned into existence and as as debt goes unpaid, we have a deflationary situation. At the same time, the Federal Reserve is continuing to print money at an historic pace. Their balance sheet has expanded from about $3.8 trillion this year now to about $7.2 trillion, and there's talk of another stimulus package. All that money creation is going to be inflationary. Now, going back to 2008, when the financial crisis hit, the Fed did what they always tried to do, They reduced interest rates. They dropped interest rates to 0%. Many of you recall that. When interest rates dropped to 0%, you would think people would be in line to borrow money. But it didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Well, let's go back to the Albert Einstein quote. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of the truth. Let's engage in a little critical thinking. Let's follow Mr. Einstein's advice. If you think about it, when money is loaned into existence, people have to be willing to borrow. When money is loaned into existence, businesses have to be open to borrowing. So when money is loaned into existence, more money creation can only happen if businesses and individuals are willing to go out and borrow more money. And that can only happen if, collectively, the economy has the capacity for more debt. When the economy has collectively reached its debt limit, you can reduce interest rates to zero, but nobody's going to borrow because, collectively, they can't afford the payments. So what happened? The Fed reduced interest rates to zero percent. Borrowing didn't pick up. So the Fed decided to engage in temporary money creation, temporary quantitative easing. Now, in the Revenue Sourcing book, I quote an article from 2010 that announced the central bank would buy $75 billion per month in treasuries. What that meant was the Fed would print $75 billion a month. That, at the time, was extreme. As they were printing money at that time, they said they would also keep interest rates at exceptionally, exceptionally low levels for an extended period. Well, at the time, we said that it's a slippery slope. This will only get worse. 
And what happened from 2010 through earlier this year, although you could see the writing on the wall, is that the, but the bubble that the Fed created through money printing began to show signs of bursting. And then it did, and now the money printing is starting again. Only now we're not talking billions, we're talking trillions. And what began as something that was temporary now seems like it is here to stay. Mr. Jerome Powell, the chair of the Fed, was on 60 Minutes not long ago, a couple weeks ago, and said that there's no limit to how long these tools can be used. They've changed their tune because they have no choice. So what does this mean for you? Well, in the Revenue Sourcing book, we talk about the fact that you want to prepare for a deflationary outcome and an inflationary outcome, which means you have to have two buckets of money. And we talk about something in the book called a revenue sourcing map. And again, if you are just joining me today, you can go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. You can order a copy of the Kindle book at an extremely low price. You can email us your receipt. We'll be glad to get you out a physical copy of the book. Again, go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. That's retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. I'll be back after these words. You are listening to RLA Radio. I'm your host, Dennis Tubergen. Thanks for tuning in today. Hey, today we're talking about my new book, Revenue Sourcing, and some of the planning strategies that you might consider using in this new normal economy, what we call a post-pandemic economy. And, you know, there really is nothing new under the sun. In fact, I should really apologize on air today to my history teacher because when my history teacher first told me that those who don't study history are doomed to, do, to repeat it, I was frankly a young and dismissive student. But now that I've become a serious student of financial and economic history, I know that he was right. I found an interesting quote that I put in the book by Abba Iban, and Mr. Iban says this, History teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted all their other alternatives. History teaches us that men and nations behave wisely once they've exhausted every other alternative. Now, based on current policy response, which is massive money creation, it seems like most of the world has shunned the lessons offered by history when it comes to things financial and economic. Now, the reality is that bubbles and busts have been taking place for thousands of years for one simple reason. Human behavior is predictable. The political response to bubbles is even more predictable because the collective behavior of groups of politicians is predictable to an even greater extent. Now, when you study history, you see that a sound money system is initially used for commerce. Then this sound money system is weakened as politicians overpromise and need to fund those promises. Now, overpromising politicians have only three options to be able to fund their promises. They can, one, raise taxes. They can, two, cut spending. Or they can, three, print currency. And eventually, the temptation to yield to printing currency is just too hard to resist. And money creation begins, but usually as a temporary measure. And if you've been listening to the entire program today, you know that in the first segment, I gave you several examples of money printing. And eventually, because of the consequences of money printing, gold then is reinstated or gold and silver, are reinstated as money. Well, this temporary money printing always eventually becomes permanent, and then money creation grows exponentially. Money creation then creates a series of bubbles and busts, and each 
subsequent bust is worse is worse rather than the prior bust. Eventually, money creation doesn't work, and the currency is destroyed by massive currency devaluation, and you get rampant inflation. Then a reset occurs, and a sound money system is adopted. So this sequence has repeated itself over and over again throughout history. We have a sound money system. The sound money system is weakened because of over-promising politicians. Eventually, currency printing starts, although at the beginning it's called temporary. Temporary always becomes permanent. Then it grows exponentially. And then we get a series of bubbles and busts. And each succeeding bust is worse than the prior bust. Eventually, money creation quits working. The currency is destroyed. We get massive inflation, and we have a reset back to a sound money system. Now, the world today is radically different than at any time in the past because of this. This is the only time in recorded monetary history that every currency in the world is a fiat currency. Now, a fiat currency is currency by government fiat or decree. There's nothing backing it. Fiat currencies are debt. They're loaned into existence, as we've talked about on today's program. This is the first time that we've been at the end of an historical money cycle with no currencies that have a link to something tangible. The last world currency to eliminate the link to gold was the Swiss franc, and that was 20 years ago in 2000. Prior to that date, the Swiss franc was backed by 40% gold. Now, here's why that's important. Every world central bank can now print currency. That's allowed the present bubble to reach levels never before seen. And the last time we reached the end of this historical currency cycle in the United States was 1929. And at that time, the U.S. dollar, as well as some other world currencies, had at least some gold backing. So the big question is this. Will the Federal Reserve be able to reflate the bubble? No one knows the answer to that question. We are in uncharted territory here. Should the Fed be successful in reflating the bubble? We don't know how long it will be until the next bust, but we do know this from studying history. There will have to be a bust. Now, I can understand as we're talking today that you as an aspiring retiree would like to be able to tell Have someone tell you what's going to happen and when is it going to happen, but no one can tell you the when. But here's what I can tell you. You have two very real risks, and you will most assuredly have to deal with them both in the future at some point. We are likely going to have deflation for a period of time, followed by inflation. In either outcome, the traditional Wall Street-only advisor approach of investing traditionally will cause you, in my view, to fail. So you'll want to look at revenue sourcing, which advocates protecting assets from deflation and inflation at the same time. And it does so as part of a strategy, not a soundbite. If you haven't yet ordered the revenue sourcing book, which lays everything out, Go to retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, and you can order the revenue sourcing book at a greatly discounted rate. You'll get the Kindle version, and once you send us your receipt for the Kindle version, we'll be glad to send you a physical copy of the book. The website, again, is retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books, retirementlifestyleadvocates.com forward slash books. Thank you for joining me today. Have a great week.